Hello and welcome to part two of our video on malformations of cortical development. I hope the ending of the last video was not too abrupt or too sudden. I had forgotten myself that I had to put a transition slide there because the subject is so broad that I decided to split it in two separate videos of about half an hour each. So let's continue. The last video ended with band heterotopia. We had discussed, we, we were discussing disorders of neuronal migration. We had discussed lysencephaly. We had discussed band heterotopia, which can be considered a mild form of lysencephaly, uh, a kind of under-migration disorder, but can also be considered some kind of gray matter heterotopia because we have basically a rim of gray matter situated in the cerebral white matter where we don't want to find any gray matter. So let's continue with our discussion on gray matter heterotopias. So a band heterotopia or so-called double cortex syndrome can be considered a gray matter heterotopia. What other types are there? Well, let's start with the case. This is a five-year-old boy. Uh, this boy was brought to the emergency department because of a first ever seizure. And what do we see on this unenhanced CT of the brain? We see several small nodules protruding into both lateral ventricles. They are very discreet, but this was picked up by our radiology registrar on call. And this patient received an MRI the next day, and this confirmed the finding of subependymal nodules protruding along the margin of both lateral ventricles and protruding in both lateral ventricles. On these T2 weighted images, these nodules have the same signal intensity as the cerebral cortex. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with a gray matter heterotopia. What is a gray matter heterotopia? It's basically the presence of neurons in abnormal locations because the normal process of neuronal migration was interrupted. And most frequently, we find these islands of abnormal arrested neurons along the ventricular walls, and we call those periventricular heterotopias. Another type are the subcortical heterotopias, but these are much less frequent. And I'm going to show you an example right away. Periventricular nodular heterotopias are not that infrequent, and they can also be rather heterogeneous. You can have just one, only one. You can have multiple uh, nodular heterotopias or periventricular heterotopias. These can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. This is an example of a symmetrical case of diffuse or diffuse uh, periventricular nodular heterotopias aligning both lateral ventricles. When you have multiple periventricular heterotopias, symmetrical, um, then the cause is most likely genetic. We see these more often in female patients, these symmetrical heterotopias. There's often a familial occurrence and certain genes have been identified that are associated, mutations in these genes that are associated with the presence of periventricular nodular heterotopias. And the best known is probably a mutation in the filament A gene, which is located on the X chromosome. Notice that these islands of gray matter have the same signal intensity as cerebral cortex on both T2 and T1 weighted images. So I already told you, if you see multiple periventricular nodular heterotopias, quite a mouthful every time, isn't it? If you see multiple of those, it's mostly genetic. If you see a single one, it's mostly acquired. When you see a single periventricular nodular heterotopia, there is no gender predilection, there is no familial occurrence, and these are often located in the peritrigonal region, which is considered a watershed region, a vulnerable region in the embryological brain. 
So the theory is that these are probably the result of damage in a small region of the developing brain, whatever the cause of that damage might be. So, so far for periventricular nodular heterotopias, let's move on. What do we see here? A lot, I'd say. Uh, let's look at the ventricles first. Then we have that out of our way. We see the typical moose sign um, that we know from patients with a complete callosal agenesis. So this is very likely a patient with a callosal agenesis. And then we see a mass-like lesion in the left temporal lobe. So I encircled it for you, but it's hard to ignore. Let's be honest. So we have callosal agenesis. We have a bulky mass. Is there anything else? Oh, yeah. We also have these abnormalities, which look like they have the same signal intensity as cerebral cortex. Not so good to see on these two-weighted images, I have to admit. So these look also like gray matter heterotopias located above the left lateral ventricle. Now, okay, even if we assume that these are gray matter heterotopias, what is this? Well, we're still talking about uh, you're still following uh, a session on cortical malformations, so this is not going to be a tumor. This bulky mass-like lesion also has the same signal intensity as the cerebral cortex, both on T2-weighted images and T1-weighted images. We see some very small kist-like lesions interspersed in the lesion. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see here, uh, yeah, as shown by these small arrows. And we also have some thinning of the cerebral cortex uh, in the temporal lobe lateral of this mass-like lesion. This was not a tumor. This was a curvilinear subcortical heterotopia. Once again, a mouthful. What are curvilinear subcortical heterotopias? Well, these are, as the name says, heterotopias, gray matter heterotopias located in the subcortical white matter, or let's just say the white matter. They often extend towards the cortex. And here we have another example. So we see here lesions with similar signal intensity as cerebral cortex and the deep white matter of the left centrum semiovale, and they are in contact with the cerebral cortex here and here. If we examine these lesions a little bit closer, we see once again small cyst-like um, foci or foci. I don't really know how to pronounce that in English, I have to admit. Uh, focus, plural foci, whatever. We see multiple areas with uh, kist-like signal on T2-weighted images in and around this abnormality. And we also notice that this lesion has kind of a swirl-like appearance. And that's why they call them curvilinear subcortical heterotopias. Heterotopia because it's gray matter in a strange place, an abnormal place. Subcortical because it's underneath the cortex and curvilinear because they swirl a bit. And very often you see subtle CSF-like spaces in and around these cortical malformations. And here shown with the arrows in case you hadn't noticed them yet. And this is still the same patient. We have already seen the T2-weighted images. As you can see on these coronal uh, reconstructions, there is once again a patient with a callosal agenesis, which you can deduce from, from the ventricular morphology here. And we also see that this heterotopia is quite extensive because it extends all the way from the subcortical white matter towards the lateral ventricle. And we call that, when it does that, a transmental heterotopia. Uh, this is still the same patient. Based upon the coronal images, we could already suspect the patient to have callosal agenesis, and these sagittal reformats confirm that. We see no corpus callosum whatsoever. Furthermore, we see a nodule located 
on the tuber cinereum of the hypothalamus. This is a hypothalamic hamartoma. And that's not even all. We also see some kist-like expansion of the liquid spaces underneath the vermis. This is probably not a megacisterna magna because there is some mass effect on the vermis and too much extension, in my opinion here, um, upwards against the tentorium cerebelli. The pontovermian angle is a bit increased, so this could be a Blake's pouch just or maybe it's an arachnoid cyst. Anyways, we see a lot of other anomalies in this patient. Uh, and for those of you who haven't seen it, an arrow to the hypothalamic hamartoma. Now, subcortical heterotopias are much less frequent than periventricular nodular heterotopias, and they are not so well known. Uh, in 2019, a study was published in Neurology, which is basically the largest study to date discussing subcortical heterotopic gray matter abnormalities in a total of 107 patients. Uh, so not much is known yet about them. You have some bilateral symmetric cases, but these are exceptional. These are actually quite rare. And in those cases, you can suspect a genetic basis, but the majority are unilateral. And either these are genetic but post-psychomatic genetic disorders, or another theory is these are acquired and the result of a prenatal injury, such as a vascular insult. Very often, other abnormalities are present in patients with subcortical heterotopias, such as callosal agenesis and brainstem and cerebellar malformation. There are three subtypes based on the location. When the subcortical heterotopia extends towards the cortex, it is called a curvilinear subcortical heterotopia. When it is located uh, in the deep white matter and extends to the lateral ventricle, it's called a nodular uh, subcortical heterotopia. And when it extends all the way from the cortex to the lateral ventricle, it's a transmantle heterotopia. So that concludes our discussion on disorders of neuronal migration. Final topic, and then we have discussed the most important groups of cortical malformations or the malformations of neuronal organization. We have three I would like to discuss with you. We have polymicrogyri, schizencephaly, and focal cortical dysplasia type 1 and 2a. For those of you who remember, in the previous session, we talked about focal cortical dysplasia type 2b. And I told you then, this is a disorder of neuronal proliferation, but you also have focal cortical dysplasias type 1 and 2a, which are disorders of neuronal organization. Let's start with polymicrogyri. Let's look at MRI images of this young man who received an MRI of the brain because of visual disturbances not further specified. On these T2 and flare images, at first glance, we see very little, nothing. I don't see anything. And the patient also had a sagittal uh, 3D MPRH as part of his, no, this is, no, this is not a 3D MPRH. This is a, a standard spin echo T1. My apologies. The patient also had a standard uh, T1 weight image sagittal of the brain. And if we then compare the perisylvian region in the right hemisphere with the perisylvian region in the left hemisphere, there is a difference. Yeah, I seem to have windowed these two images a bit differently, but that's not a real difference here. It has to do with the cortex. Let's magnify these images a little bit. This is the cortex and the right perisylvian region. This is the cortex and the left perisylvian region. The cortex looks a bit more blurry, but we also have the impression that the cortex actually consists of a lot of very small gyri compared to the normal perisylvian cortex. So what are we dealing with? we are dealing with polymicrogyri, which is basically a descriptive term. Poly means many, micro means small, and gyri means, well, 
gyri. So we have many small gyri, polymicrogyri. Polymicrogyri is just like focal cortical dysplasias uh, were not one disorder, but basically a group of disorder, a very heterogeneous group. Polymicrogyri is basically just a descriptive term, literally it just means too many, too small gyri. Both radiologically and pathologically, it's a very diverse group. They all have in common that they are probably the result of neurons reaching the cortex, but organizing abnormally there, whatever the reason for that. And the abnormality can be unilateral, it can be bilateral. When it's bilateral, it can be symmetrical, it can be asymmetrical, so everything is possible. The most frequent type is the perisylvian polymicrogyri. Uh, polymicrogyri situated in the perisylvian region, like the one I've shown you. Polymicrogyri can be the only finding in a patient, the only abnormality, but it can also be associated with other malformations. Um, it can be an asymptomatic patient, uh, an asymptomatic finding, as was the case in our patient. The visual disturbances had nothing to do with the polymicrogyri, or if it's pathological, it's mainly associated with epilepsy. And it can have a lot of causes. It can be genetic. There are several genetic uh, syndromes associated with polymicrogyri, but it can also be acquired. And the best known of the acquired causes would be congenital cytomegalovirus infection, because the cytomegalovirus and the developing brain of the uh, embryo has an affinity for the germinal matrix, tends to infect the developing neurons there, and as a consequence can lead to cortical malformations. Let's give you an example of a patient with a con congenital cytomegalovirus infection. We see here ventriculomegaly. This is a newborn. We see increased signal intensity on the two weighted images and the periventricular white matter supratentorially. Here, the signal is also a bit too high for my liking. And especially here in the temporal lobes, the T2 signal is diffusely increased. We also have some patchy signal increase in the cerebellum. These findings. Uh, point towards uh, leukoencephalopathy, white matter disease, which can be seen in congenital cytomegalovirus infection, especially here the temporal lobe involvement is very typical, and I wouldn't be surprised on follow-up if you would see some cysts in this area. Now, we're not talking about white matter disease, we're talking about the cerebral cortex, and is the cerebral cortex normal? No, it isn't. If you look carefully, we see, especially bifrontally, but it's pretty diffuse actually, we see that the cortex consists of many very small gyri. So we are dealing with polymicrogyri. Don't believe me? On this uh, image, we can compare abnormal cortex with the region with normal cortex here. And the left parietal lobe, we have a region with normal cortex. Let's compare that with this region and with the uh, right hemisphere, the normal cortex is very smooth, and here we have a lot of very small gyri. So polymicrogyri caused by congenital cytomegalovirus infection. Now, what is also very peculiar about polymicrogyri is that the appearance of this disorder can change during the development of the child, during the first two years. In a newborn, the area with polymicrogyri, the cortex there, is very thin. However, when the child is two years old, 25 months, that's two years about, we see that the cortex has thickened. And the thickening of the cortex can sometimes be misleading because sometimes we have the impression that we just don't see a lot of gyri, but we don't really see the many very small gyri separately anymore. So don't be mistaken. The cortex looks thickened. It looks a bit bumpy, but this is basically polymicrogyri at an other stage of development. And it is believed that this differing appearance is caused by the myelination of the subcortical white matter near the polymicrogyri. So as I said, the fact that the cortex looks thick, although it isn't thick, it looks thick, uh, can sometimes 
give this disorder a bit of a misleading appearance. So this is a patient with polymicrogyri, but if you were to look at it very rapidly, you would just say, oh, I see a region here with little gyri. I'm going to call that pachygyri. Don't do it. I told you in the first video, I'm not a fan of the term pachygyri because it's just descriptive and it gets gets used wrongfully a lot of times in my experience. Look at the cortex carefully. We can see the cortex here. We see a lot of very small gyri. If you look carefully, and the fact that the cortex looks thick has just to do with the delayed myelination of the subcortical white matter in the region of the polymicrogyri, leading to a falsely thickened appearance of the cortex over here and a bumpy appearance of the cortex. So don't fall for that pitfall. So the second disorder of cortical organization I would like to discuss with you is schizencephaly. So what is schizencephaly? Well, for the diagnosis of schizencephaly, you need two things. You need a large CSF-filled clefts, and those are clearly present here. And the newborn child, roughly situated, you might even say, in the uh, territory of the middle cerebral artery. These CSF clefts, that's not enough. They have to be lined by this plastic cortical tissue, and that is the case. If we magnify this region of the brain, for instance, we see a lot of very small gyri. This is the imaging appearance of a polymicrogyri, and we need to have abnormal cortical tissue aligning uh, large CSF clefts to be able to speak of uh, schizencephaly. So schizencephaly, Radiological diagnosis is based on the presence of large CSF-filled clefts lined by this plastic neuronal tissue. Can have the appearance of polymicrogyri, but let's remain general and just call it this plastic tissue. So then we have schizencephaly. The C here is missing on this slide. What can I tell you about schizencephaly? Well, it's bilateral in about 40 to 50 percent of cases and often not always like here it wasn't but often in about 70 percent of cases there is no septum pellucidum and in about 30 percent of cases there is hypoplasia of the optic nerves so there is an association and the reason for that is a bit unclear between schizencephaly and septo-optic dysplasia septo-optic dysplasia is a syndrome characterized by as the name implies absence of the septum pellucidum and optic nerve hypoplasia. Schizencephaly is no genetic disorder. There has, to the best of my knowledge, not a single gene or chromosomal abnormal abnormality or whatever been discovered in patients with schizencephaly. So the theory is that schizencephaly is an acquired disorder probably the result of an insult occurring somewhere between weeks 10 and 16, which is the pre-migratory phase of cortical development. Accidentally, in the patient I'm showing you here, we had or we performed the two star images, and we see some hemosiderosis lining these large cleft on the T2 star images, like we can see it here and here, but also at a distance here, for instance. And we also see hemosiderosis in the lateral ventricles. So this patient must have suffered a hemorrhage of some kind. So basically, this is in line with the theory that schizencephaly is an acquired disorder and probably caused by an insult to the germinal matrix and the pre-migratory phase. And how to understand that? Well, if you get an insult before the neurons are able to migrate and you get an insult in part of the germinal matrix, well, that part is gone. Those neurons are destroyed and the brain can no longer develop at the region where germinal matrix is destroyed. So we get a large defect there because there are no neurons left. However, the neurons and the germinal matrix surrounding the defect, these can still proliferate, migrate, organize. So we get this plastic cortical tissue lining these large defects because neurons are still able to migrate along the borders of the defect. I hope this is clear. There were 
there are two definitions, basically, to complicate things. There are two definitions of schizencephaly. The most used definition is that a schizencephaly as a CSF containing cleft, which runs from the pile to the ependymal surface of the brain and is lined by this plastic cortical tissue. And when you use this definition, you can make a distinction between two types based on the morphological appearance, a so-called closed lip schizencephaly, in which the cleft surfaces are very narrow and not widely separated, or an open lip in which they are wide open and widely separated. So that is the first definition. Then there's an alternative definition, and not many authors use that, but I believe there is something to it. The second definition says that schizencephaly is basically a full thickness transmantle column of this plastic gray matter extending from the pia to the ependyma, period. The CSF cleft is not imperative in this definition. Uh, in this definition, the authors or the people who believe or use this definition also assume that an insult took place. Uh, there is an area of brain that hasn't developed normally, but this is lined by this plastic tissue and the cleft or the defect can be obliterated by the dysplastic tissue. So a cleft is no longer absolutely necessary. And we see here, this is, for instance, an abnormality that would correspond to the second definition. We have no cleft, but we have this plastic cortical tissue extending from the cortex to the lateral ventricle. We can also see that here on these coronal reconstructions, and here we have magnified images, which just prove that there is no cleft whatsoever. Now you're probably wondering, what's the difference between this and, let's say, a transmantle subcortical heterotopia? And that's a good question. One might wonder, because we still don't really know what the cause is of subcortical heterotopias, if the two aren't actually the same or the same manifestations of the same pathol or just manifestations of the same pathological process who received a different name. More research is necessary. I'm not going to answer that question. I'm just speculating a bit. Now, if you use the second definition, there is a difference between what is meant with a closed lip and an open lip schizencephaly. According to the second definition, a closed lip schizencephaly is a schizencephaly in which there is no cleft uh, present, and an open lip is one in which there is a cleft, and the cleft can be very narrow, very thin, or it can be very wide, as we see here. Here we see a very wide CSF cleft. So... Why do I believe that the second definition, that there is something to it? Because in a lot of cases, so you have a partial cleft, you, you have the impression that there is some tissue loss actually here, aligned by this plastic tissue, and you also often see a very small ventricular dimple. So it really looks as if there used to be a cleft there that got obliterated by the dysplastic tissue. And sometimes, so here we have the ventricular dimple, and sometimes if you look very carefully and you perform high resolution 3D MPRA sequences or so, you can still identify a very subtle cleft, as I'm going to show you here. So we have once again a partial cleft, at first sight not completely and extending to the ventricle, aligned by cortical tissue and with the ventricular dimple. Also notice the septum pellucidum is absent. So we have a CSF filled cleft, dysplastic cortical tissue, ventricular di dimple, and an absent septum pellucidum. And these are magnified 3D MPRA images. So we see the incomplete cleft on these images. But if we scroll a bit further and look very carefully, we can still see a minute cleft going all the way and to the ventricle. But it's easy to understand that in some cases that this small cleft can become completely obliterated. And just a final example showing you exactly the same. We have the impression that there is a cleft not going all the way to the ventricle, a ventricular dimple, and this is all aligned by this plastic cortical tissue. So this is the same 
patient, if I'm not mistaken, and this patient did not just have an absent septum pellucidum. Look carefully, look at the optic chiasm. This is very, very, very small. This is hypoplasia of the optic chiasm. And look here, the optic nerves are barely discernible, barely discernible. So this is a bilateral optic nerve hypoplasia. This brings us to the last group of disorders, focal cortical, display, focal cortical dysplasia type 1 and 2a. I'm going to show you an example of type 1. And it's pretty rare, to be honest. I've only seen one case, no, two cases in my still young career until now. So the first thing that jumps to mind is, well, the ventricular morphology doesn't look completely normal. So we have to check sagittal images to see if the corpus callosum is normal or not in this patient. We see an incomplete inversion of the left hippocampus. We see a periventricular heterotopia here, as indicated by the arrow. Now, this is all not that important for this uh, topic here. We are we are looking for a focal cortical dysplasia. Where is it? Well, it looks totally different from the focal cortical dysplasia type 2B. So if you're looking for a transmantle sign, stop looking. Take a closer look at the right temporal lobe. There the right temporal lobe is. And let's compare the right temporal lobe with the left temporal lobe. I, you know, I uh, switched them so they look the same. And what do we see? Well, the right temporal lobe is smaller than the left temporal lobe. It is hypoplastic and has a diffusely increased signal on T2 weighted images and not just on T2 weighted images. Here, the upper row shows you the right temporal lobe, T2 weighted images, flare images, and 3D MPRH images, so T1 images. And here, the same for the left temporal lobe. And we can see that the gray-white matter differentiation is completely gone. Signal of cortex and white matter are basically the same on all sequences, and the temporal lobe is very small. This is the radiological appearance of a focal cortical dysplasia type 1. So what do we have in focal cortical dysplasia type 1? We have a disruption of the normal cortical architecture, but there are no abnormal cells. So in focal cortical dysplasia type 2b, you had balloon cells, for instance. You won't have that here. It's a difficult diagnosis, both for the pathologist and for the radiologist, because it can look normal uh, on MRI. If you see imaging abnormalities, it is, for one reason or another, often in the temporal lobe, which looks hypoplastic, and we have a diffusely increased signal intensity in the white matter, which might be due to the fact that neurons are interspersed in the white matter, especially in the subcortical region of the white matter. So that concludes our two videos on cortical malformations in the brain. So let's summarize and provide you with some key messages. So there isn't just one type of cortical malformations. It's a very heterogeneous group of disorders, uh, all the result of some kind of interruption in the process of cerebral cortical formation. And they can be acquired or genetic. So the etiology is also very diverse and heterogeneous. Uh, we use the approach introduced by Barkovic, which classifies them according to the stage of the presumed insult. And although that is not always probably completely correct or probably a simplification, I believe it's a very helpful approach to familiarize, to familiarize yourself with these abnormalities. These abnormalities can be subtle, especially focal cortical dysplasia. So especially when you're dealing with children with epilepsy, you need a good MRI examination preferably three Tesla examination, including a high resolution, isotropic 3D T1 weighted images and flare images. Because in children with refractory epilepsy, the whole point is detecting the epileptogenic lesions. And because they can be subtle, you have to try hard and do everything you can. 
let's shortly summarize some classical odd mini appearances of these abnormalities. Here I'm showing you a microcephaly with a simplified gyral pattern. Remember that the whole point of imaging a microcephaly is not really to confirm the microcephaly. It's a clinical diagnosis but to look for potential structural causes um, or clues for a specific genetic syndrome or so. This is the classical appearance of a focal cortical dysplasia type 2b. We have a subcortical lesion with increased um, signal intensity and the characteristic transmental sign extending toward the ventricle, which is not seen on these images. This is a classical lysencephaly. We have a smooth sulcal surface or, or gyral surface and a very thick cerebral cortex. This are periventricular nodular heterotopias, and this is polymicrogyri. This can be a bit confusing because this is a somewhat older child of maybe two or three years old. And the area of polymicrogyri has a very bumpy appearance and the cortex appears thick, which can be a pitfall for the diagnosis of polymicrogyri in these patients at this age. And this is a typical pronounced schizencephaly. We see large CSF filled clefts lined by this plastic tissue. Now, a last thing I would ask of you, be very precise when describing these abnormalities and, if possible, refrain from using Agira and Pachygyra. Why do I hate them? Because I am showing you here three different abnormalities and in the radiological report, and this is not meant as an insult or so, but in the radiological report, these were all described as Pachygyra. And then it's basically useless to call it Pachygyra because you still don't know what these patients have. They have three totally different uh, abnormalities. This patient has a microcephaly with a simplified gyral pattern. This is a classical lysencephaly. And this is a patient with polymicrogyri, which can be a bit confusing because once again, we have a very thick, bumpy cortex and it's quite diffuse and symmetrical, making it not such an easy diagnosis in this case. So want to know more, there's only one man. James Barkovich, so check him out, check out his books, check out his articles. Uh, and if you have any comments or questions or whatever, leave a message on uh, the YouTube channel, or you can also send me an email, neuroradiology.online at gmail.com. Thank you very much.